Um, I think that we really need to be able to be testing on living systems rather than anything that's synthetic um, or done in a laboratory um, with manufactured chemicals or test tubes. I think it has to unfortunately be a living thing that's most similar to a human being and as far as I can see it, I think that it's animals that are the closest thing to that. The case for invasive animal research is further weakened by consideration of the large and growing array of non-animal or non-harmful alternatives. Uh, these are described at great length in my book, but a few examples include simply mechanisms initially to ensure better uh, sharing of existing data, much of which is locked up inside the commercial files of chemical companies and drug companies and excluded from the public domain. So that's an important first step. Additionally, uh, there is a physico-chemical evaluation of test compounds, uh, sometimes via computer simulations. So we're talking about things like structure activity relationships, uh, which try to predict uh, biological activities such as toxicity on the basis of chemical structures. We're talking about expert systems, which uh, use uh, known rules about toxicity, along with information about a particular compound under consideration to make uh, predictions about toxicity. We're talking about uh, systems designed to predict the distribution of compounds around various bodily compartments. There's no real alternatives. Uh, using a cell culture is not really a real alternative to working on a, a, a living animal. There are a wide variety of cell cultures. Uh, we can use bacteria, yeast, protozoa, uh, mammals and human cell cultures uh, to uh, predict a wide variety of uh, toxic endpoints and other endpoints. These can be combined to increase the spread of toxins that are detected. They can be used static or perfused with solutions that flow through the cultures uh, and give us information uh, through measuring um, biomarkers, which are compounds produced by cells. They give us information about things such as the uh, time of onset of toxicity, the duration of toxicity, the magnitude of toxicity. There are gene chips uh, or cDNA microarrays, which are tiny wafers which have got hundreds or even thousands of spots of DNA uh, on them and which interact with um, the products of cells uh, which have got mRNA included in them and the amount of mRNA can be increased or decreased depending upon uh, the compounds that the cells are exposed to. So uh, this allows us to profile the types of changes uh, to the genome of cells that, that are caused by certain types of toxins and we can use that information to then predict the toxicity of unknown compounds. Uh, well prior to more invasive endpoints that we tr have traditionally used such as changes to entire cells, organs or organisms for that matter. Uh, we can use surrogate human tissues, for example, uh, human placental tissue obtained naturally during childbirth has a functional receptor, receptor for nerve growth factor, which allows us to use it to conduct uh, neurophysiological, pharmacological or toxicological investigations. We have a variety of advanced imaging modalities uh, for examining human patients, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, CT, uh, PET, MRI, uh, ultrasound, advanced x-ray modalities and so on. There are human psychological and sociological studies that, and population studies that may allow us to identify more compounds causing cancer and other toxicities and try to understand better uh, why people make risky lifestyle choices and guide us as to interventions that may be effective in human populations and so on. Now of course Non-animal methods are not currently able to answer all questions about human beings, particularly given current technological limitations. However, the same criticism, of course, is certainly true of animal models, which have a considerably more limited capacity for further development. Well, I know you say there are alternatives, but scientific research is always going to be very complex and it's always going to involve a lot of steps. So you might start with cell cultures, you might start with some kind of computer modelling, but eventually you're going to have to test whatever it is on entire living systems. And unless you're going to start testing them on humans, we have to test them on animals. On the other hand, uh, non-animal models can offer certain important advantages. For example, humans uh, are already being used in terms of human volunteers and human cell cultures. When we use uh, human cell cultures or human tissues, we get results 
uh, much more quickly usually, uh, much more cheaply. Uh, they're obviously more reliably predictive for human patients and consumers and they give us greater insights into human biochemical processes. In the last decade or so, there have been increasing numbers of people graduating with PhDs and other advanced degrees in various scientific fields who are being employed by animal welfare organisations around the world and who are actually starting to produce some really high quality research and publish that research in scientific journals and present it at the scientific conferences which actually evaluate this research in a systematic and credible fashion and actually describe um, the increasing array of alternatives and, and actually uh, in some of these people are involved in developing new alternatives. So there's a lot of high quality research and work that's going on in this field. I think that's exciting. I think it's a fairly recent phenomenon and I think it's important that the uh, animal advocacy movement continues to support this kind of work and also to get information about this kind of work out so it actually reaches the scientific community, reaches policy makers, reaches students who are, are interested in this issue and studying this issue.